I'm a feminist, but uh, my husband, Tom Zielinski, wrote a book with his podcast partners called Best Pick that goes with his podcast. It's about the Oscars and about film. And the other night he had a little book launch downstairs in the Waterstones. And when I got mm. to the top of the stairs, the woman said, and could I have your name, please? Because I need to tick you off a list. And I said, my name's Deborah Francis White, but I'm the wife of one of the authors. And she was like, oh, impressive. And I said, I know, I feel very, I'm the wife of one of the authors, a very celebrated man. And I said, look, normally he comes along and says, I'm Deborah's husband yeah, or Deborah's yeah, producer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was loving being a wife. Like there was no pressure on me. All I got to do was admire the man yeah. and just be like, my husband wrote this book, my husband, my husband. And mm. I was really enjoying it, to be honest. I had, like it was an hour and a half of being Betty Draper and it was just wonderful. <sighs> you were being the first lady of Oscar trivia literature. That's exactly what I was. And I, oh, it was wonderful. I was so Jackie O. And mm. I wore quite a floaty dress and I was there going, have you have you seen my husband's book? Would you like to have your book signed by my husband in the corner? I never really used the word husband very much because I sort of think we're partners and in so many ways. Yeah. But I was really enjoying it. I don't like the word wife and I don't really like the word husband either. I find it too grown up for what I am or what I have. Like I feel it makes me too grown up. Yeah. But I'm coming into a space where I'm like, Oh, I'm a, I felt like it was really nice to kind of admire my husband's achievements. You could call him lit husband, like literature. Lit husband. husband. Lit husband. Yeah. Because literature and lit yes. at the same time. These are good suggestions. I'll write uh, these down. Yeah. If you've got any more. <laughs> book boy. I'm trying to figure out this stuff book, out. Book boy. <laughs> book boy, I think, lowers his sex appeal. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That makes yeah. him sound like like Robin. Like, yeah. like there's some superhero of literature and he's book boy. He's he just book carries boy. the bag. I don't... <laughs> Listen, Tom Slitsky okay. will be editing this. We're spitballing. They're We're going spitballing. rapidly downhill. They are, yes, indeed. They? Yes. Indeed. We, uh, we need to bring man into this somehow. Um, um, yeah. What do you think we need to brainstorm this with a man? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a feminist, but I need a male voice right now. Indeed. Um, I'm a feminist, but I was trying to think of I'm a feminist, but uh, on the train on the way here. And all I began to think of was merchandise. And I think, you know the way uh, 2000s uh, fashion is come back in i see a lot of people with writing on the back of their bums on uh tracksuit oh, bottoms yeah, and like stuff yeah. Type. Yeah, yeah juicy couture i'm thinking we could have a i'm a feminist dot 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 written on the back of someone's butt and it could be a joke of i'm a oh. feminist but i just i just really like communicating through writing on your arse so, i, I yeah. want to get a pair of trousers that say help on the back of it <laughs> and we'll see how many people uh answer that call what, more like, how's my walking? Ring this number. Exactly. <laughs> I, Which is my number. <laughs> you were looking. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. um, listen, yeah. listeners, if you want Alison Spittle's merch ideas, i.e. tracksuit bottoms yeah. with I'm a feminist dot 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 written on them on your butt, uh, then please uh, email guiltyfeminist at gmail.com or DM us and tell us there's a demand for those. Yeah, I'll do those. a Kickstarter, it's, mate. It's pretty suggestive. I would wear it. I'm a would feminist. We've got, dot, we've, dot, got, dot. we've got merch. Yeah. We can, we can ask butt. for them. We can yeah. see if our merch store would do them. We could start off with mouse pads and then bring it up to... <laughs> we, we, how would mouse pads be the butt, though? I don't know. I thought the whole point I'm was the butt. Small. Yeah, yeah, you're right. What, what, what year is it that people have mouse pads? <laughs> the same way that people we have writing on the butt. That's true. Bones. Computer mouse pads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I just thinking of really computer mouse pads for mice. Know, knee pads? <laughs> <laughs> well, like incontinence pads for mice. Little tenor, little tenor mice pads. <laughs> I mean, um, these are all strong ideas. Yeah, um, you think we could bring in the little... I, little think, we, strong, I think we need a man. <laughs> strongest of possible ideas. Uh, we will we will get back to you, listeners, if any of these come to fruition. But if you do yeah. want those track pants, we can ask the merch store what they can do. Um, I'm a feminist, but yeah. today yeah. I saw a picture of my biological grandmother I'd never seen before. Wow, where did yes. you Yes. I saw it on Facebook and I paired it immediately with a no. picture of myself okay so i just hit there bro, because yeah that looks very very similar it's a big cheekbones yeah Cheek jazz. but my Your nose eyebrows. is the same my eye shape is the same my lips yes. are the same no, the eye the, the raised eyebrow expression is the same yeah. i mean i found my biological family through the eyebrow <laughs> and it's true through the shape of my eyebrows that's how i found them and I had a name and the shape of my eyebrows. That's all I had. And I, I've done a show about it. I never met my biological grandmother because she'd left us before uh, I found them. Yeah. But I said to Tom, what do you think? And he said, wow. And I said, do you think we look alike? And he said, 
yes, but you're prettier. Well, you would want that. And I'm a feminist, yeah. but for a, a, just a second, I felt delightedly competitive with my own dead <laughs> grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> with my own late grandmother, I should say. Let me do that again. With yeah. my own late grandmother. Yeah. I mean, it's not any better, is it? Like, just leave the whole thing in, Tom. It's not any better. Um, for prettiness, like, we were two girls at high school together and yeah. a boy had said that I was slightly prettier. Uh, I'm a feminist, but last week I was going to a Hindu in Butlins. I decided to step back into the eyelash perm game again. And I was in a basement in Camden where this woman put this stuff that made it smelled like burnt hair Ooh. on my eyelashes. Ooh. And she said, please don't open your eyes for 15 minutes. You may become blind. And uh, I lay there with my eyes really shut for about 15 Ooh. minutes thinking, Ooh. is the curl worth it? And listeners, it is. Ah! It is. <laughs> Blindness. Yeah. <laughs> a, I just I just looked and I was like, yeah, it's it, 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 I think it's the same way people uh, go abseiling or something like that. There's a sense of danger. I like to do that with my uh, beauty treatment. So they curl them. I had this done once. They curl it, yeah. I let really people look to have a of. Yeah, they are good. Do you think so? Yeah, they I don't are know, because they were like they were they were real droopy. I never looked at my eyelashes before. I'll be completely honest with you, I am twenty five percent prettier with false eyelashes on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like it's such a dramatic difference. My eyelashes normally they're like a little celebrity coming out of a hotel trying to hide their identity. Like it's just it's like a baseball cap across my eyes. <laughs> and they just put their hands up, going, "No photos, please." Exactly. And then so what you've done is paid a lady to blind slash beautify you. <laughs> yes. And now you see twenty five percent less well, but. Oh, my Lord. Those celebrities are coming out as if I'm to a red carpet in a ball gown. I'm Lady Gaga at the Golden Globes. Just go and love me, please, you know? Uh, yeah. Um, I'm a feminist, but I have a note here in my diary which just says, I'm a feminist, but use feminism to justify pastries. <laughs> I don't know what this refers to, but I make notes when something happens because I think, you know, I need a lot of these. And of so if something happens and I think, oh, God, that's an I'm a feminist, but I'll write it down. I don't remember how I used feminism to justify pastries, but I obviously did. <laughs> I clearly now I the, the thing that I can think of is I was in Portugal and so I was possible. having, what are they called? Pasty de Pastel de nata. De natas. Past, yeah. past, past, past Pastel de nata. Yes, it. I was Pastel going. de nata. And I can't remember why, but I know I had more than my fair share and someone else's fair share of pastel de nata. Maybe you took a man's one. Maybe you took like, how, what's the percentage <laughs> of that men get paid more than women? Maybe you I, took that back in pastries. It's <laughs> so unknown to me how I could have used for Feminism to justify pastries, but I must have said something like, well, if I'm not having pastries here, I don't know. I'm denying myself. I don't know. You, but I clearly used feminism, which is something good and righteous and important, yeah. and about closing power imbalances to justify eating more custard tarts. You're you're leaning in over the pastries and just sniffing it. <laughs> oh uh... God knows what I'm I doing. It's because the voice telling you you shouldn't have those pastries is definitely an anti-feminist voice. Maybe, Matilda. That's, that's the maybe. patriarchy. That's, that's genuinely an, any, anything that Seems that's a... like it must be more than that, though. Something happened. It'll probably occur to me in the middle of the night where there was an altercation with a man or something. <laughs> well, do you think, like, I, I really love your idea of a voice telling you, like, stuff that you want to do. I imagine the voice of a of a great feminist person, like... Uh, Man, for, for me, like Mary Robinson, who was like the former president of Ireland, I imagine her voice going, go on, Alice, enjoy it. You deserve it. Feck the patriarchy. And when it's someone telling me something like to do that I don't want to do, like, Alison, why don't you walk to the shop? It'll be it'll be the voice of my nemesis. So it'll be like, Alison, why don't you walk to the shops? Do you know, like, who, to, who is it? Uh, Winston Churchill. Trump. Trump. Yeah, Winston Churchill. Yeah. yeah. Trump. Oh, we'll, we'll get them on the beaches. <laughs> I try to do an impression of. Like, <laughs> 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 you don't eat that pastry. Yeah, yeah. Alison, don't eat that pastry. <laughs> That's my Winston Churchill. Maybe it was something like that. Um. I'm a feminist, but I was at a hen party last weekend and uh, it was in Butlins and we had a massive inflatable penis, as you do, <laughs> for the hen party. And I was bringing it in to see Boys Life, who are a super group. 
Imagine if the best members of Westlife and the best members of Boyzone stayed at home and Keith Duffy and Brian McFadden turned up and became Boys Life. Oh. Uh, and we were bringing in a massive inflatable penis, but it wasn't allowed in. So I had to walk home from all, so on my own, back to the chalet. It's about like a half a mile away. What? In the dark with a massive penis in my hands. Like it was as big as me, this penis. And I won't lie, Deborah, I felt powerful. <laughs> I did. I did do it. I ran into lots of men on the way and uh, they were commenting on my large penis and then uh, I would comment on theirs. So hey. was, yeah, I felt very powerful. How come you, everyone else got to go in and see Boys Life? Yeah, I was the maid of honour. So I had to do Can't a lot you of just, admin. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Just leave the penis outside and yeah. go in. I couldn't trust people to not to take that penis. Did you need it once the bride's <laughs> seen it? it Can't was... you just let it go to the wind? I know that's yeah. not really for the environment. Storm Eunice just takes in that penis. <laughs> I mean, but do you see what I mean? Yeah. No, I Can't know. Can't you just deflate it and roll it up or something like that? Like a, like a sleeping bag. Are we talking about That's my, exactly how I'm And then when I tuck it under my arm like a little clutch bag, my deflated penis. Exactly. And <laughs> they can't stop you taking that in. I mean, yeah, that's true. I, I just... I would never walk home half a mile. I'd just say, look, this penis has come to the end of its life. The bride's seen it. We don't <laughs> need it anymore. I just throw it into the sea like free willy. <laughs> 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 just let it Slam. dive over my head. And can I say dunk? <laughs> yeah. From an undisclosed location in North London, The Spontaneity Shop presents The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co host Alison Spittle, and a very special guest, Matilda Mallinson and Helena Wadia, talking about next wave journalism. This is The Guilty Feminist, the podcast in which we explore our noble goals as 21st century feminists and our hypocrisies and insecurities which undermine them. I'm Deborah Francis White, with me is Alison Spittle, and we're talking about next wave. Journalism. journalism. Yes, journalism for, for the 21st century, journalism yes. for feminism. Yeah. And journalism that doesn't do what it's tended to do in the past, which is to report the story from the POV mm. of the dominant group. Well, I'm kind of very used to, like, uh, I, I've, I've stopped watching uh, current uh, current event media. I thought you were going to say Coronation Street then. Well, I have as well. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know that's not a journalist <laughs> programme. Both, both for both reasons. They, they make me depressed. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, uh, I, I used to be an avid, avid consumer of uh, of current affairs media, and it would often be just people debating with each other about an abstract concept, but was actually people's lives. Mm. And it was uh, coming from Ireland, and uh, we had, uh, there was two referendums, uh, one on uh, gay marriage, and the other one was on abortion, and it often felt like, especially in the run up of. Uh, uh, to the referendum on abortion, it felt like uh, people were arguing about an abstract concept of something that really affected my life. Mm. So it's uh, they were arguing inside your uterus. Oh yeah, yeah. They yeah. were getting up there. You'd watch two men son's uterus yes. up your uterus. Yes, poking about there, going as a hypothetical, like looking at it, like you know, they had <laughs> blueprints. They knocked down this wall. Is this my new kink? Is this this is this this new? Only you can answer that. Oh, that's true. Only you can answer that. Um, yeah. But they'd be like, "Yeah, no, no, no. We want to keep it like this. Keep the original features." Yes. And you'd be like, "This is literally a part of my body. It's on a cellular level. This is impacting me." Yeah, yeah, it's impacting me, and it also felt like where people would say very, very strong things about stuff. It felt like it was directed at me, even though it wasn't. But it would still kind of hurt the same way. It's like I used to consume a lot of true crime and murder stuff. And then someone close to me uh, got murdered and I don't mm. consume true crime anymore mm. because it's just it's just a different yeah. you know, a different vibe. Anyway, don't mean to start off the podcast on that, but you mm. know. <laughs> great A banter so far. And this is great bants uh, <laughs> yeah. about how you can no longer I watch consume. true crime because of it's the so annoying. That's a real I'm a feminist but Alison, if you don't do you mind think, me saying yeah, I'm I a feminist you, but because yeah. somebody close to me was killed, I can no longer enjoy true crime and that's the, so, I'm the real victim. I know, I feel <laughs> I, I yeah. I feel I feel yeah, it is a, it's a very kind of first world problem. It's, I mean, it's it is and it isn't. I can see it being an all world problem, someone yes. being killed, but that's a great example that when something's happened to you, it no longer seems abstract. Yeah. And it's yeah, yeah. a bit like um 
I think when I was younger, there was that, you know, that heat magazine. Um, Circle of shame. Yeah, like they'd r- put Isn't red rings around our, people's cellulite. Seared into our psyches that you just say heat and I'm like, Circle of shame. Yeah, you knew. Yeah, you straight knew. away. Absolutely. Straight away. And I think at the time, I thought it was awful, but I didn't understand what it would be like. Yeah. Because I hadn't, I was nowhere near in that celebrity world or anything like that. So I didn't have any kind of connection to anyone who that might happen to. Mm. And thankfully, I think they've stopped doing that now. And it's not like people are following me around constantly trying to photograph my cellulite anyway, if I'm completely honest. But (laughs) I can now sort of, because I've got so many friends who are actors and things like that, go, oh my God, like that is a real person with real cellulite. And that's so invasive. And, you know, like uh, this is, this is, by the way, Celebrity cellulite is not the worst. They're no. not the worst victims. Again, I feel like I've veered into, <laughs> I'm a feminist, but let's today talk about proper journalism and let us think about the thighs of the noughties glamour model. Yeah, I'm sorry I started off with murder. And I mean, I really, I feel I've brought the tone right down. I'm delighted but, you have. <laughs> so I mean, maybe I'm just to... trying to make it entertaining. Yes, and, exactly, you know, exactly. Um, but you know what I mean? It I feels do. like as soon as it's, if, it, if, if we could think about it as if it were imagine it was your leg and someone was literally shaming it. Like yes. going, what's wrong with this leg? It's like, nothing's fucking wrong with the leg. Yeah. This is how women have bubbly bits. Yeah. And that's just how we are. Genuinely, since I have famous friends, like I have a friend and she's like, uh, she's doing really well and I'm still in the little green uh, Instagram circle, you know, the close friends. Oh, and you're I'm in like, a close friends with someone I, who's doing really well. You waiting yeah. to get, you waiting for her to... I am. You're thinking any day now. I'm gonna. Well, I'm not gonna see any more of these close friends, and I'm gonna think about totally. being dropped. I'm very much reassessing our friend. Are you? Like, are you? You're not Wagatha Christieing her, are you? No, not at all. No, oh, imagine this is the proper journalism of Wagatha Christie. Next <laughs> 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 wave journalism. <laughs> that story is still being reported on. I think there's a court case going on. Oh, there's such intrigue now. That is a look. That's the type of crime I'm into at the moment. <laughs> It's very low stakes. Like. Wait till it happens to you. Wait, wait. I know. Wait till I report to the press something you've said in Close Friends. Then you'll be like, I can't watch Wagatha Christie anymore. Yeah. It really hurts. It's very painful. My it basement me. got flooded, you know. And so <laughs> I know. I listen. I know when you're lying. I, I, know, I would yes. never report one of the lies because I'd know. I'd be like, she's she's doing this just for me. I bet I'm the only close friend on her. Do you know? Can I just say? I think being friends with you, Deborah, mm. has made me uh, think of Kim Kardashian like a human being. And I think I didn't before. No, okay, no, no. we need to pause it yeah. right the fuck there. <laughs> Why does being friends with me make you think of Kim Kardashian at all? Well, because like you are like you know the podcast as well. You are you are famous to a degree. In you know we can discuss. <laughs> it might be. I think. Let us be clear about the enormous great big fuck off golf, <laughs> the Grand Canyon between the guilty feminist yeah. and. Keeping up with the Kardashians. Yeah. I think in so many ways, some of, and listen, in some ways, I'm very happy about that golf. Yeah. Uh, because it's a golf of, I think, uh, uh, worthy content. Uh, worthwhile, worthwhile content. Yeah. Um, in a- another way, mm. the Kardashians, they're one of the, I think, only household names now. I think, you know, most people are only famous in a niche. Mm-hmm. But I think nearly mm-hmm. everyone in the world knows who the Kardashians are whether they want to or not. Yeah. I feel I don't impose myself on people who don't want to know me. I feel like people who find me uh, and find the podcast are delighted to have it. And that's wonderful. And I hope you are. Listeners, I hope I'm not assuming that. Um, But I think I have not imposed myself on the world the way the Kardashians have because I'm too polite. Well, I think, well, like, I feel... (laughs) There are many people who don't want to know me and I'm I'm like, that's absolutely good with me. Like, if you don't want to know me, you won't. You won't be in a Pepsi ad, like, like, giving a policeman a can of Coke or something like that. Listen. Would you do that? (laughs) I, I mean, I really, really, really hope that I would never give a police officer a can of Coke and by doing that, save the world and uh, solve racism. (laughs) And I say that with the full knowledge that I don't know what she was offered and what's your price. That's the thing. What's price? If you're offered 10 million quid, it's probably you have to really go to bed then going, I can happily say no to 10 million quid. But, yeah. So I might go, oh, well, I could do good things with that 10 million quid. Maybe she was offered like world peace. Maybe it's like the devil has done a deal. No, I wouldn't no. do it. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't. I Listen, okay. the, de- look, the devil's not buying souls anymore. Not in this economy. I'd be lucky to have my soul optioned by the devil. If I, he'd, 
at most he would he would give inflation has gone yeah no but also just with the pandemic and things I don't think souls are being bought anymore no I think it's more like very much a seller's market yeah I think it's more like I think the deal with the devil now is the devil says you need to sell your soul to the public right through the memes of Instagram and TikTok and I will merely look on, laugh, and take ten percent of the profits that you get for being an influencer. I think it's more like that now. The devil's more yeah. your agent. The he devil help, would be a great agent. He helps you sell your soul. I think I once was represented by the devil, but it's only lasted <laughs> six months. Then he dropped me for being a woman. Um, you know, this is all I'm saying. And yeah. I think the devil is an agent who allows us to sell our souls to okay. the public. Yeah. And Kim's got a much higher price for her soul than I have for mine, let's be completely honest. But I I feel that, like, this is my point. I feel sometimes with your, like, we can debate about your level of fame or whatever. Yeah, let's Um, Yeah, we're not. (laughs) But uh, I feel that sometimes people will often take people within bad faith because they're famous. Mm. And I think, so I don't do that with Kim Kardashian anymore. Mm. I try and think of the nicest reason of why she would do that. And oh. then, you know, keep quiet and, about and, it. And being friends with me has helped you be more generous with Kim Kardashian because <laughs> you're imposing on her an integrity yes. that you need to impose on me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> need that... to or... No, not need to. <laughs> see. see that, yeah, do you get me? I mean, this I think of... after the podcast, we're going to need to explore this in further detail. But I think <laughs> we've I got as far to the line of me being a parallel for Kim Kardashian in any way, shape or form. Yeah. Listen, I'm flattered because I, I know that, Alison, there's one thing I know about you. You are so generous and you would never say anything spiteful. You are only generous in your... You're been... so kind. No, you're so, so kind. And so I know that you've meant that in the loveliest possible way. Did it come out bad? No, it's oh, just, I'm, no, no, not at all, not at all, not at all. It's more that I know that if somebody else said, oh, yes. you remind me of Kim Kardashian yes. because you've taught me to think about being generous to people or something like that, they might not mean it nicely, but I know you could only ever mean it nicely. Absolutely. Because you're um, a very generous person and you really do, you really are, you're a very big supporter of other women. I, well, some women <laughs> No, you are. No, you are. You are. Yeah. Anyway. (laughs) Hello, Guilty Feminists. It's Deborah. On the 5th of March for International Women's Day week, that's right, we get a week, we will be in Brighton. And I am very excited to tell you that the Guilty Feminist tour guests for the opening night of the show include Jessica Hines... From Spaced and W1A herself and our Royal Albert Hall show, Zoe Lyons off all over the telly and The Guilty Feminist, introducing Sakisa, who is an incredible new emerging comic. Plus, we have both Jess Robinson and Grace Petrie doing music and a very special guest, Laurie Penny, talking about her new book. If you are in Brighton or can get to Brighton, do not miss this show. On the 6th of March, also for International Women's Day week, we're in Nottingham with Jade Adams, Jen Brister, Celia A.B. and Jess Robinson. And the tour continues throughout the spring and summer. We're coming somewhere near you. Go to guiltyfeminist.com and find out where. On the 31st of March, we've got Campus Springtime. If you had a ticket for Campus Christmas, it's still yours. Uh, If you haven't got one yet, there's still some left and all the money goes to LGBTQ plus refugees and also alarming Syrian schools. And for people who've been asking, when are you going to do your Guilty Feminist Stands Up Stand Up show again, Deborah? Well, I'm glad you've asked. All the tickets are sold out at WOW, but... April 26th to 7th of May, I'm back at Soho Theatre. So if you saw it, tell your friends. If you haven't seen it yet, it's all about coming out and going in. It's a very personal show. It's one that I'm not going to be putting on the podcast because it's too personal. So please come along, book tickets for that now. I'll also be in Australia and New Zealand with Grace Petrie touring The Guilty Feminist in July. And you can get tickets for all of these things at guiltyfeminist.com and clicking on live. You can join our Patreon if you'd like ad-free episodes and exclusive Zoom hangouts at patreon.com slash guiltyfeminist. And now back to the podcast. Our first guest today is a multimedia journalist who's been published across leading national news outlets and the co-founder of Refugee Media Centre, which works to improve refugee representation in the press. She is joined by a multimedia journalist and presenter, 
who focuses on feminism, social justice, and interviewing her favourite indie music stars. She has appeared on BBC Newscast, Times Radio, and on Channel 4's Inspiring Women panel. And together they have created the amazing new podcast, Media Storm. Please welcome Matilda Mallinson and Helena Wadia. Hi. Hi. Hello, Guilty Feminists. Um, thank you so much, Matilda Mallinson and Helena Wadia, for joining us today on The Guilty Feminist. Do you have any of your own I'm a Feminist Burt's? I actually weirdly had quite a few I'm a feminist butts come up this week alone. Oh, wow. wow. Um, so guilty week for Helena. it was a guilty week for me. So I'm a feminist, but I persuaded my sister not to buy a red dress for her 30th birthday party. Not because I didn't think it would look nice on her or it wasn't appropriate, but because I wanted to wear a red dress. Oh! oh. For her 30th? Her 30th. Oh yeah. my gosh. Oh, whoa. It's Just, her 30th. She's allowed to wear red. You have to wear any complimentary colour. But what, my dress is really nice. What reason oh, did wow. you give her? I was just like, oh, I don't think that one's uh, that one <laughs> wow. was well, is, is nice. Well, if, if, if Helena's sister, if you're listening, um, and she will be because she's so lovely and supportive. Oh, oh, oh! What's her name? Ali. Ali, you go get that red dress, and in fact, wear Helena's red dress. Yeah, yeah. she's got to lend it to you now. Yeah, you're gonna look like you're in a girl band. I love it. Now. Oh yeah, you could go as twins. Oh yeah, she would love that. <laughs> <laughs> Matilda. I'm a feminist, but as you can see, I've somewhat injured my pelvis. And when I was... Okay, the listeners well, the at list- home <laughs> are not... What are they going to think about Matilda's that, on crutches. <laughs> okay, Matilda's on crutches. Matilda's that doesn't imply she's hurt her pelvis. Matilda's injured her pelvis. Mm-hmm. And when I was... Uh, <laughs> I love that you, you refer to yourself in the Like Craig David is injured his pelvis. <laughs> <laughs> Craig David all over your pelvis. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I mean, who oh, wouldn't God. want that? I know, actually, he's going up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... I know. Um, go anyway. off track. Yes. Anyway, I injured my pelvis. Oh, lovely. <laughs> <laughs> and when I was getting the x ray and waiting to find out if I had broken my back for the second time in my life, yes. I was just counting my lucky stars that I had gotten my holiday bikini wax before stripping to my knickers for the male oh. radiologist. Because <laughs> you're lying on the table with your trousers by your knees and your, your top by your bra. Just thinking, this could be even more awkward. Yeah. I, I love that you're worried about him seeing your labia, but not your bones. You're like, <laughs> oh, you can go deeper. Like, like, yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. Matilda's like, wow. broke my back once, I'll do it again. Yeah. Wow, wow. So much to unpack there. I love uh, it. Firstly, <laughs> I do not want Craig David anywhere near me or my pelvis. Okay. <laughs> Men who speak about themselves the in the third person need not apply. Um, secondly... I mean, I think if I'm completely honest, although I also like a bikini wax, I think doctors have seen it all and non-waxing's coming back. So they, I know. Is it's, it coming back? They, I know. Might, they might, when they see a unwax, they might think, uh, you know, very trendy, very very happening, very at <laughs> the moment. So really, you're telling me that very hot I morning. should have been feeling self-conscious about the fact no. I no. did have no. the bikini wax because that has gone out of fashion. Every woman should just turn up with whatever she's got going on down there and uh, uh, any every person with yes. whatever they've got going on down there, hair or no hair or mm. somewhere in between, Yeah, we should all be confident of what we've got. However, that's never going to happen. If I, if, I, <laughs> if I ever have to get my pelvis x-rayed, I'm going to like... Make I think like a merkin out of like a Brillo pad. Give oh, myself wow. some metallic. The cubes. way you said that was like you were gonna go on a night out. Like well, if I ever get my pelvis x-ray, <laughs> <Yeah. right? laughs> <laughs> well I'm gonna go back home. Get saving some, up. <laughs> yeah, like it's like it's a blue Peter kind of makeup, or it's like get some sticky black plastic and some. Yeah. Uh, it's, um, it's either go to Mallorca or get my pelvis examined. I can't work out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna go I for mean, the I recommend it. I am currently sitting here on opiates for this oh. reason. <laughs> Is that allowed? Yes. yes. I love the way that you're like uh, pubes are coming back. As if it's like um, plaid shirts or something like that. I mean, how do we know? <laughs> I, 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 I will see. You know? I, I just, I just pick it up from the fashion. Um, like you I'm, pick up the, the, the yeah, <laughs> yeah, just the fashion, the fashion pages. No, because I, I know now. it's because yeah. it's because it's because lots of young women, Gen Zers, 
don't shave under their arms now. Yes, and I can yeah, see that. Yeah, so yeah, I don't yeah. believe they Not go and have a Brazilian and then leave their arm hair. That is genuinely my autumn winter seasonal look though, is pubes. <laughs> 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 when spring summer comes out. Yeah. Well, this is the thing is I feel if you're Gen Z and yeah. you've got, you know, underarm hair and a tattoo or underarm hair dyed blue, everyone knows it's a style choice. Yes. For me, if I grow my underarm hair out, it's just going to look like I've let myself go. People well, are going to be like, they don't think it's a style choice for me. So I, I'm going to continue to be smooth. I get you. I But I feel like with me, because I keep my armpits hairy at the moment, and I think I'm holding on to bits of you because I'm 30, Jesus, I'm 32 now. And I used to get ID'd a lot for alcohol. Mm. And now I just want to go up to someone and lift up my armpit. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's not the armpit of a 17 year old you know? <laughs> ID me now you know? has that stopped has your ID days yeah over? and isn't it but it's like you've got to go to America because they ID everyone there because it's 21 or over and okay. so I think I could yeah I mean <laughs> I've been ID'd very late in the day in America and it's a wonderful feeling I really want to be ID'd again go to America okay okay they, I, I promise you you've got such a baby face they will ID you in America brilliant brilliant, brilliant. literally go and buy booze you don't want just to be ID'd over there yeah. <laughs> and a plane ticket to America yeah. exactly plane ticket to America please I need my self esteem <laughs> exactly um, so yes. hello new wave journalism that's what we're talking about today because you're two journalists you both went and did a masters in journalism and started working in newsrooms what made you want to start your own newsroom I think what really made me want to do something more independent in journalism was that prior actually to becoming a journalist, I was working in TV and in TV production. And I was working on um, shows. I was going to call them documentaries, but let's be honest, they're not. I was working on shows <laughs> that uh, were, for example, um, Help, I'm Addicted to Tanning. I'll let you guess what channel they were on. Yes. But um, I was working on those kind of shows and I just thought, oh, this is not the, the the stories that matter. These are not the stories that I need to be telling. And so that's definitely what made me want to get into journalism in the first place. And then when Matilda and I were working together in a newsroom at a mainstream media outlet, we realised that we were both struggling with the same thing. Yeah, for me, there was a tipping point when I had managed to get the green light on a series on multicultural businesses that had been started in the UK by people who'd come here having fled war zones. And then suddenly there was this resurgence in people crossing the channel and dinghies and the editor pulled the series because quote they didn't want to encourage this kind of dangerous and illegal migration and wow. um, we that we then proceeded to publish a torrent of articles on channel migrants not one of which had a single quote from anyone who'd ever crossed the channel or been displaced yeah um and I really boiled up I mean it's a good thing I'm on opiates right now because I can feel <laughs> I can feel the monster re reviving but I really flipped out and drafted a letter to the editor which Helena helped make a little less fireable um <laughs> <laughs> and and it and, and the and whole started rolling from that <laughs> I know I know that like you, you're fantastic as in like I, I feel that you you know you're not perfect and no one's perfect but you're trying to make the world a better place you're basically like guilty journalists <laughs> <laughs> I'm a journalist yes. you are. but I'm a journalist I hate bar. the news yeah. <laughs> 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 you're, you're I'm a journalist but it's I'm a journalist but I hate the news <laughs> I hate it <laughs> I'm a journalist but I literally hate reading any of the news <laughs> much less writing it um, so what was your starting place with media storm so what occurred to me as an issue that affected migrants and that occurred to me because that's the area in which I specialize it became evident upon discussion with Helena and other people in the newsroom this was a very scalable issue affecting lots of groups so just like people who've migrated irregularly are very rarely consulted in articles affecting them. So sex workers are very rarely consulted. People with disabilities, people who've been through the criminal justice system, people who've been homeless. Oh my God, we realized that that was 
a concept that had a lot of episodes in it and every episode would be completely revealing in a completely different way. Mm. We'd be targeting and embracing different communities, bringing something new to very old stories by centering the perspective that maybe should have been centered all along, but by some miracle is missing from most of the mainstream coverage. And not only did we want to speak to those people, we also wanted to hear from them about what we as the media could do better going forward when reporting on them and on the issues that affect them. Journalism has in some ways been part of the problem of the story of the world and the way we see people and other people and uh, has sometimes been an enemy to feminism, hasn't it? Like, Mm. can you tell us more about that? It's hard to know where to start here, but I'm going to start with the concept of balance and how we define balance in journalism because yeah. that's kind of the um hot topic the creed yeah, yeah of all journalists is to be balanced and where we decide balances is yeah. still defined by who has the power who holds the platforms and so sometimes some of the episodes that Helena and I have done on media storm have struck some listeners as imbalanced because we come from a very different starting point. We don't take the cultural conversation as the starting point. We go to the people directly affected by the issue as the starting point. We think that the conversations we should be having, the debates we should be having, should Mm. be determined by the people actually affected by an issue. So, for example, um, we did an episode on trans issues and I had some... Listeners come and ask me why, or maybe they said maybe it was, they felt like one thing was missing, which was that we didn't discuss or explain J.K. Rowling's perspective. And I just have to say, we didn't actually talk about J.K. Rowling once in the episode. So I thought it was quite interesting that that came up. And when I said that, they were even quite surprised that, oh, why had that come to our mind? Isn't it telling that it feels amiss to have a conversation about trans issues without even touching on that perspective? I just found that very interesting. You know, I'm sure 100 years ago, having a conversation, a debate about female participation in the workplace would have been amiss without asking Freud whether we were going to ruin everything by being really super horny or whatever. (laughs) But basically... Which we have, to be fair. I mean, he wasn't wrong. He was not wrong. I mean, Alison, Alison's already declared her penis envy. Yeah, Yeah, very much so. It was a it was a Freud themed uh, a head absolutely, party. Absolutely <laughs> Every was. head party is a Freud themed head party. Yeah. But like maybe, maybe we think that that journalists we shouldn't be afraid of steering away from debates yes. that people think are mandatory because actually so much of the conversation is taken up by really trivial us versus them issues that don't actually affect that many people like as a comedian uh like i think maybe in the past like four or five years there's been a few news stories that have come out about comedy i went on to like a i i was once i I had moved freshly over to england and i was asked to go on this really really big radio show i was really excited about it and they said uh you're well we want to debate about freedom of speech and comedy and i was like yeah okay i don't mind you know and it was uh, me and this lovely guy called arthur smith who uh is a comedian as well and we're supposed to be on either side of this debate because he's an older white man and i'm a younger uh white woman i don't know why he's <laughs> <you're not white. laughs> i don't know why it's in white for him classic <laughs> tv debate for yes. the only white people <laughs> yeah. but but we're different ages yeah but and um uh, but we got on really well we discussed we were talking about freedom of speech and comedy we both came from the same place practically and it was i think it was john humphreys is that his name yeah he's retired he's a lovely man did you make him retire with your lack of, <laughs> yeah. your lack of polarized fighting it's because we were having a conversation and not arguing because we were just uh we were kind of both coming from the same place which is that you know there's a, an illusion of freedom of speech and comedy like i feel uh, and you know what uh, the Daily Mail did a report on my podcast, The Wheel of Misfortune, saying that it was terrible that the license fee money was going to a podcast uh, where people were talking about shitting themselves. I get that. Like, fair <laughs> enough. But there was a part of me that was like, where were the freedom of speech warriors and comedy t- for us then? Like, they come out for people that want to talk about that. This is not, yeah. this is not like it's. That's just, a great point, Alison. Mm, yeah. Did those angry comedians who leap to the defense of Ricky Gervais? 
say, yeah. why can't these two young women talk Tom about Russians. embarrassing moments yeah. and, and uh, <laughs> scatology, body know, functions, all feel, of those things. Yeah. But they didn't, no one said anything. No, they didn't say anything. And it's so, it's, when I did the conversation with Arthur Smith, I had one of the freedom of speech comedians get quite angry with me and say that I threw him under the bus. Uh, because the when I was getting interviewed, John Humphreys was going, would you be able to do material that's not Islamophobic? He read out the list. Mm. Basically, for context, for listeners, it was a new story, a very flash in the pan. They come out every year about freedom of speech within comedy. A student uh, comedy night, they were students, they weren't comedians, they weren't au fait with comedy. They asked uh, a comedian to sign a contract that would say you wouldn't do any uh, Islamophobic, this, yeah. racist, uh, sexist, transphobic material. And he did a joke himself uh, where it was like, well, this is what I would say. And it was, that you know, the joke was, and then that's like his right to do. And everything. Mm-hmm. I don't even, I have no issue with that joke in a way. He was just saying, oh, well, I can't say anything. So when John Humphreys came up to me and said, well, would you be able to do this comedy night and then he read out all the bits and I was thinking yeah I have a I have a bit about pissing into a pint glass that I think is not Islamic phobic or yeah. <laughs> you know I didn't say that on Radio 4 but I was like yeah I could do it like I was mm. genuinely I, don't, I don't think I'm a better person or anything like that it was just I was asked a question I answered it mm. and it was strange and I get but it but Arthur Smith's the nicest person in the world I've never heard him do racist material or exc- no. exclusionary material I, I love Arthur Smith do you know it was great It was a gr- I had a great time I got free pastries <laughs> <laughs> Listen, did you justify animal. those pastries yeah. through feminism? I did, yeah. yeah absolutely. <laughs> but so it's so, you know, to be and you're part of a new cycle there, mm. you know, and uh it's interesting to hear you talk about like, you know, your your podcast coming from I is it I suppose is this coming from like a perspective of you're not getting people to debate about abstract ideas, it's about people talking about their lived experience. Well, exactly. So many, especially minority groups, get caught up in those kind of debates on TV and in articles and they get so caught up in these like unnecessary polarized I'm gonna say it culture wars oh my god you know what we wanted to do was approach it from the way where those people that are caught like in the eye of that media storm who we talk about them all the time these people we talk about trans people talk about refugees talk about migrants talk about disabled people all this kind of stuff but do we ever really hear from them properly? Yeah. Well, yeah, where they're think, really given the mic. Yeah. And actually, it's what I love. And I must declare my interest in Media Storm because I, um, it's sort of from the House of the Guilty Feminist. But I really did want to have you on and I would have you on even if this was not from the House of the Guilty Feminist because I love what you're doing in terms of you're really giving the mic and you're not giving the mic and saying, here's the three questions about JK Rowling or about whatever it is. You're saying, what would you like to say? Yeah, we're not saying justify your existence yes. right which is kind of the first barrier for anyone who has um immigrated to this country in order to claim asylum or has been through the criminal justice system that's not the question that we're asking them that's not the debate we're having and we're kind of rejecting where society is in that debate and asking yeah what are the questions you think should be asked and what's fascinating about this you're starting from a different neutral yeah exactly. you're not you're not assuming that the current debate yeah and where where the middle of that is is where the seesaw should begin mm. you're going okay let's just leave all of that behind so many other people are doing that we don't need a podcast on that everyone's doing that let's take it over here and go you pick the question you say where the middle is and that's really exciting yeah which might make us be seen as imbalanced if you have a traditional idea mm. of what balance yeah. is but we have an unconventional idea of mm. and balance. it's so important to talk to those people that we're talking to with lived experience it's so important to ask them not only their their experiences but their expertise on the subject these people mm. are experts yeah. you know yeah. you don't need to ask a ceo of a homelessness charity for their expertise and then a person experiencing homelessness for their experience the person experiencing yeah. homelessness has expertise yeah. in that yeah. subject because so they've be, lived it. Yeah, normally it would be, uh, you know, if you have an interview with someone who's been homeless at all, mm. um, it would be, you know, tell us how much you've suffered or how traumatising mm. is this. Yes. Rather mm. than what do you think of the policy? Why do you think this policy isn't working? Yeah. Mm. And would this policy have worked for you? Mm. Yeah, I often find that media want your trauma, but then they yeah. want you to tell them that you're okay. 
in mm. order like I find out with mental like a mental health I don't know what the best word to say but like I'm quite open about uh, my like uh I was gonna say journey, uh, but you know, uh, have you been on X Factor? I <laughs> should know. Let's go on X Factor. Just go. I'm mentally ill. Let's get this out of the way first. I mean, the Tell mainstream me media, the news is not that different from X Factor it's in that way. It's not that different. No. Not that different. No. Where they yeah. sort of try and get you to see, and I know, I know people yeah. who've done it, and it is true that the producers will say to people on those kinds of reality shows. Could you talk about, you know, we've done some research and we know that you got in trouble for smoking marijuana at school. Could you talk about your drug problems? Yeah. And it's not like they didn't have a drug problem. They <laughs> got kicked out of school because someone else had a joint and they had a toke. Yeah. But like, can you turn that into a story mm. where again, you you milk your trauma? Yeah. I'm not saying that specifically happened on X Factor. I'm saying that just as I know that generic, yeah. gen- generally from those kind it's of shows. It's ac- accurate. Journalism is supposed to be accurate above all. And, yeah. and that damages the accuracy of it. Do you know anyway. what, actually, just to go back to mm. X Factor, because there's like a big there's a big boom in the moment of like people that have been on X Factor telling their story on YouTube and it's so interesting mm. that's lived experience they're experts on how X Factor works and everything oh. isn't it it's like, so it's like we an episode yeah <laughs> yeah genuinely can because, I can I ask yeah. about this turn of phrase lived experience yeah. because yeah. I don't think everyone knows what it is when I first heard it I thought, well, all experiences lived experience. Why do you need to say lived? Can't you just say in my experience? Can you please unpack that? I think I get it now, but I want you to unpack it to see if I've got it right. Well, so we think of experience often in terms of professional experience, experience in the sector. So the CEO of a race justice charity who is white might have experience in the area of race but they don't have lived experience I might have experience in the sector of immigration as an immigration reporter but I do not have lived experience of displacement Mm. yeah so it is yeah yeah it's that personal knowledge that is gained from that first-hand experience right so, so it's stuff you put on a CV is and experience. It, so is lived experience sort of, in some ways, the expertise you get from living in a world that doesn't support you or that marginalises you at times or that makes you feel a bit sometimes gaslit, like... Uh, yeah, yeah, because it's, of it's your... a stake. I think that that's... that's... <laughs> It's the expertise that you get from that perspective, but it's also having a stake in it. Mm. You have an emotional stake in the issue because it directly affects you. And I think that there's a bit of a um, myth in journalism that if you have a stake in something, you are therefore partial, you're biased, and you cannot report on it accurately. Mm. But I don't think we acknowledge that not having a stake in an issue is a privilege, and that makes you biased in your yeah. own way no one's in a vacuum no no there, yeah. there is no neutral men in comedy used to look at me a bit like I was fantasizing that it was more difficult for women uh in comedy or that we often had to deal with sexual harassment mm-hmm. and I used to what I remember one time talking to three male comedians I was the only woman there and I ended up crying because I felt so frustrated it wasn't like I was sad or they triggered me I was just so frustrated yeah. that they were being patronizing to me and going um I mean if you think that's what's going on, then you live in a fantasy world. And when Me Too happened and millions of women came out and said that was their experience of being in male-dominated environments um, and Me Too was largely driven by the entertainment industry, they can't now deny it. So if there was a similar argument in a dressing room, I would be the one looking at them like, so you're going to disregard that huge structural movement and they would not have the emotional stakes anymore. Mm -hmm. Now, we'd all had experience of gender politics backstage, but I'd had lived experience of being on the marginalised end of that. They had not witnessed that. And I hear white people all the time going, well, I haven't seen anything racist in this company. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, you haven't lived the microaggressions. Yeah. Is it that? Am I getting closer? Yeah, it's absolutely that. And I think though, a kind of, problem that really good example raises though is that it did take millions of women Mm. to say me too for us to be believed whereas you know right now there isn't like this millions of people having a movement about some of the topics we've covered on the podcast like refugees or anti-asian abuse and I think it's so sad that it takes these global movements Mm. Because for lived experience to be believed. It's people almost flagellating themselves. I feel like when lockdown number one happened and it was like June and there was a mm. big thing on Twitter about 
the Me Too movement within comedy. I had a breakdown in July because it was just too much. Sometimes I feel whenever I get involved in news side of comedy, where I, because I sometimes I can't shut my mouth and I'll talk about stuff because it really annoys me Mm -hmm. and it doesn't do my career any good. Mm -hmm. Like I should, I should really keep quiet about it. But, (laughs) (laughs) but I feel like uh, I just feel so frustrated that I have to say something. But sometimes I have felt like that I've kind of not not been used as a wrong word, but I feel like maybe sometimes I feel frustrated with talking about your lived experience and then people listening and then nothing changes. Mm. I don't want that for other people. Mm. Like I don't want someone that's trans to go on television or something or an Asian person or anyone to talk about their perspective. I feel that the media as it is at the moment It's a horrible machine for people. Yes, this is a really important point. And this is why the mainstream media definitely needs to represent these kind of minorities as more well-rounded, like normal people. You know, when we hear about trans people or, or, you know, any other minority group, we we often hear these kind of negative um, trauma porn stories kind of thing. And yeah, this is why it is so important that, you know, in this kind of new wave journalism, we learn to represent people as fully rounded human mm. beings. Yes. Um, you know, we did an episode on fat phobia and like part of the episode was about medical fat phobia and how, you know, plus size people are going to the doctor and they're not being believed about their medical ailments because everything is being put down to their size. Yes. I spoke to a professor who has created a course on how to treat plus size people when they're at the doctor. And literally the whole course is like, treat them like a human. And it is, it is bonkers that we have to have a course to say, you know, treat this minority group as a human. But unfortunately, that is something at the moment in the current state that we have to do. Yeah, it is bonkers. And that is exactly the kind of argument we're trying to present within the journalism industry. Treat these. It's something that seems so blatantly obvious. You know, oh, maybe when we're talking about these issues, we should be including the voices of the people actually affected by them. But if you start looking at articles about migrants, about crime, and you start seeing the voices that are not there, you will realise that we are so far behind that standard when it comes to journalism so when you say oh you don't want to see people going up and talking about their traumatic lived experience and nothing happens this is where I think the media needs to like steer the wheel a little bit more strongly because when we do have these lived experience testimonies given they're put up as one side one of the relevant voices in the debate probably against someone who then disagrees and actually I think what we are arguing with this new wave journalism is that some voices are more important than others. Some perspectives are more important than others. And that is the perspective of people with lived experience. So what have you learned? You've now met a phenomenal number of people who we wouldn't normally hear from. What have you learned from them? So one of the things that we have learned about the importance of prioritizing lived experience voices is that they can tell us very specific policy failings, Mm. very constructive ways that we can improve these chronic, apparently unsolvable issues that just haven't made headlines. I mean, for example, do you remember the Afghan resettlement scheme that Mm -hmm. the government got a lot of political clout off after the Taliban takeover in Afghanistan? And they said, oh, we're going to resettle all these people. And everyone was like cheering them. And it was a whole great hurrah of white saviorism. Yes. Well, we discovered from speaking to two Afghan sisters who were separated in incredibly dangerous, tenuous circumstances, that this scheme was not operable months after it had been announced and all of that applause had been milked. It hadn't even opened. Yeah. What? (laughs) So they got all of the all of the claps and everything and Mm -hmm. and the praise. And it's still not still not functioning. The sister is still stranded. (sighs) I'm going to go to the house and 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 I'm going to go to the house and
Yeah, she's saying the reason that I don't want to go out of my room, I'm scared that the people that I've been sold to them, they find me. She's saying, I don't know what else to do. I'm just, my only hope is to be with you. You're suggesting that this government pretended to do something and actually did something else. Look, I know it's, I know it's shocking, but you know, we're, we're here to tell the truth, guys. So. I, mean, I would love to hear Boris Johnson's lived experiences of those parties. Yeah, like, absolutely. I was going to say, to be fair, their party budget's been pretty high. They haven't had a lot of funds to <laughs> Boris Johnson speaks as if he has lived experience. When he gets up and he talks about migration and he talks about how mm. it's, oh, it's stupid to get on a dinghy on the channel, you think, well, clearly you you must think you know better. I'm telling you, if there were climate change in London and he was in any danger, he would be on the first dinghy out. He yeah. would be like, yeah. you know that man in the uh, oh, yeah, Titanic yes. who grabs a child and yes. pretends to have a child? So. Now, Boris Johnson doesn't need to <laughs> pretend to have a child. Well, no. He pretends not to have children he actually has. <laughs> but in all other ways, he's that guy on the Titanic. And then he he'd be saying, saying, this is smart. <laughs> yeah, he just grabs any six children survive. and goes, definitely all mine. Definitely yeah, all check mine. it out on Wikipedia. They're all mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um another okay, another mind-blowing policy failure which we've just discovered on the one of the most recent episodes we were looking at homelessness and um and why it's so easy to fall into it. Mm. I spoke to a woman who left prison and struggled with homelessness and this is something many many people coming out of prison and particularly women face by the way you have literally got women's prisons giving people tents on exits but basically tents. Tents. yeah you um because they've got nowhere to go yeah mm-hmm. and they're not there's such a shortage of accommodation but then the other issue is okay when you come out of prison okay it takes six to eight weeks for universal credit to come in so if you don't have a support system and you need benefits to get your feet on the ground you can't apply six to eight weeks before leaving prison you have to apply when you leave prison so for six to eight weeks these women have no benefits they'll be put in if they're lucky they'll be put in accommodation but they still have a fee that they have to pay and no way of paying it So when you were in the hostel with other women who'd come out of prisons and had no money to pay their service charge, how did they keep their place in that hostel? Well, a lot of them ended up working as prostitutes, stealing or committing crime. And the hostel knew about this, the staff, but they kind of turned a blind eye as long as the women paid the service charge. Can I just ask as a feminist sidebar, you're really people that I know take great care over language and how people are represented. Um, normally, I would hear feminists say sex work, mm. and you've said the word prostitution. It was a discussion Helena and I had because, well, we run our work by each other, and she was saying, um, you know, is the term prostitution appropriate really now? And we didn't know. But, I mean, this is actually a really good example because we're doing an episode next week with sex workers, and we're going to ask them, you know, because we don't have that lived experience. Great. And we so have a bit you're told. saying, yeah, we are saying it's not up to us yeah. to say that. So next week you'll have those answers because you'll yeah. have been talking to. And like, I love the way you really seem to spend time with people and you seem to really go out and find people and not just get given someone a PR agency would give you all or, you know, someone that's like, oh, Bob's got mm. a mate. You know, like <laughs> yeah. you, you really go out and find people with who are impassioned and who are experts and who have lots to say, how do you go about doing that? Or is that asking your journalistic secrets? Yeah. <laughs> well, no, but it's a good question to have because ultimately we want more people to be doing exactly that, going out and asking. It really varies though, because for example, right now what I'm doing is pinpointing a drug dealer I can speak to. That is a very different I've seen method that on your Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> I've noticed that. Tilda's, Tilda's, <laughs> yeah, Tilda's saying, um, any chance anyone knows any drug dealers? I promise it's for work. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's also, yeah, if it's anyone a... knows any, it's not for work for me. But <laughs> 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 I don't trust the sticker 
fingers on the lampposts. I don't know what you are. So. We'll, 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 we'll hook you up, Alison. Yeah. Um, Sometimes there's a bit of coaxing involved, isn't there? Because a lot of these communities oh, totally. are very disillusioned with So with sometimes um, it, it takes a lot for somebody to speak to us because, yeah, they've become so, like, disenfranchised from the mainstream media. And, I yeah, I especially found that, well, in quite a few episodes, actually, I especially found that in the episode we did on trans rights because I think that trans people were so used to being approached for these kind of faux media debates on whether they exist or not yeah. that um, mm-hmm. I got some straight up no's until, you know, I spoke to them and, and laid out that I understand the issues in the media and that's not what we're trying to do. Yes. Um, we found that... Um, People get scared, lost minutes. People get scared. And, and back out. Yeah. It's amazing. You're talking about this and like, I just got so many memories coming back. I did an article about uh, street harassment. It wasn't about me being fat, but people harassed me on the street because I was fat. Like it was a reason of why they did it. And I kept getting called by a journalist for a full week to go on a TV programme to discuss the sugar tax with the Irish uh, Minister of Health. And I'm like, what is this anything to do with street harassment? And the journal- a journalist was like, yeah, you can tell him you're not going to take it anymore. And I've got no beef with the Irish Minister for Health or the sugar tax. I'm like, I just don't want to be called a fat bitch yeah. on the street. Like, their priority there, the fact they're calling you for a yeah. week when you, yeah. like harassing you, yeah. when the whole thing started with you being harassed, shows that their priority isn't platforming your view their priority is them getting their professional it's shit. entertainment and it's yeah. entertainment news is entertainment so one of the main focuses of the podcast is asking these people with lived experience what the mainstream media is doing wrong and in what ways the mainstream media can improve on their reporting to report more responsibly here's an example we'll play you a clip um, with Paul Atherton who is currently homeless Never, ever, 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 ever use the term the homeless. There is no such thing as the homeless. There are people experiencing homelessness. We are not an homogenous group. You know, we have diff- different political opinions, different backgrounds, different, everything is different. It's never the homeless. Because in the minds of the public, if you use terms like that, they will immediately hear, oh, that's them. That's other, that's, that's not me. It's become such an us and they thing. And one of the biggest reasons it's become like an us versus them is because the us, the people that are in the newsrooms currently are very often one type of person. And until newsrooms are diversified and not this kind of faux diversity where you're like, oh, we've got a black person, we've got an Asian person. Bame, yeah, cool, I think we're done. Yeah, Until yeah, it's yeah. an actual level of diversity, including working class people, yes. transgender people, yes. all across the LGBTQ plus spectrum, all across different genders, races, and not, and you know, actual knowledge of the issues until we have those people and not those people brought in for an internship on 15k at the bottom for a year those people at the top then you know this people will still continue to be scared of talking to the media and it creates this vicious cycle where you just kind of can't come out of it because nobody wants to talk to the media and therefore those voices don't get heard and then when those voices don't get heard we think one certain way and the cycle continues. Yeah, because sometimes when I see like two white cis men debating something on the news I'm in my head I'm like oh they couldn't get anyone else to talk about this or whatever and it makes me feel kind of like happy that it's just those two men that are on the (laughs) side and that people aren't being thrown to the wolves. This is a thing that we have had said to us by some journalists or some mainstream news outlets that it's actually very difficult to get these voices because people are sceptical of journalists. Yeah. You know, and firstly, that's just... If you're a journalist, that is literally your job. So I I don't think that that really... Like, I do understand why it's important when we're saying, oh, there are certain people that are not properly represented and stories that affect them. We should say that, look, journalists are under a lot of time pressure. Mm. And, you know, if you're trying to get someone to talk about something traumatizing, there's a lot of safeguarding to deal with. Certain communities are difficult to access. But if you are a journalist, that is literally your job. It's not okay to go and just do a subpar piece of journalism. Give it more time. You know, build the trust. Persuade someone. Why telling their story 
is something that they should do. And to do that, you have to find out what they would get out of it and actually make sure you're delivering that. Is this a product of the 24-hour news cycle and the fact journalists Mm. are paid a lot less and they're paid just to write a freelance story? And if someone's giving you like... 300 quid. Should I tell you what journalism is if you're sitting on that salary on that desk? You are literally regurgitating information that is already online in a thousand different places, rewriting it and putting it up on your news outlet's website so that they can slap their own ads on it and monetize it. You are taking releases from press agencies that give you the basic facts. If you're going to include quotes, it will be a tweet from Boris Johnson, a tweet from the CEO of some relevant charity. You can do that 15 minutes, the article's out. That's how most digital news is done. Because now we're living in this kind of thing where if your story's one minute too late, it's old news. Mm. Yeah, But I know like the Guardian, we had the Guardian on and Kath Viner talked about like Amelia Gentleman taking like 18 months to break Windrush. And had Amelia Gentleman not broken Windrush and pushed and pushed, she said when she first went to, you can listen to the episode, it's on the Guild of Feminists, but she said when she first went to MPs, no one was interested, just no one weren't interested. And it wasn't until she broke the story and made a fuss about it. And a large majority of people in this country went, oh, that's really wrong. Like, that's really wrong. Because it seemed so repugnant to most people. Mm, Yeah. And it wasn't till that happened that MPs and MPs with cabinet positions started going, oh, yeah, we care about this. Oh, yeah. And Priti Patel's going, oh, do we? Last thing we would have wanted, you know. And it's like, well, you did know about this, but it took a journalist 18 months to break it will clearly, and I'm not saying The Guardian's perfect and I know people have got issues with The Guardian on all sorts of things, but on that front, had Kath Viner not funded Amelia Gentleman a proper salary for 18 months to break it, it never would have happened. Yeah, Yeah. and you do have this slow journalism movement you know tortoise media is a really Mm -hmm. great news outlet and Mm -hmm. and all these leading publications they will invest in some slow form investigative journalism but we don't think the balance is quite right and one of the things with the guardian and why the guardian can do that is they have a very different business model that does Mm -hmm. rely often on funding and donations from supporters it's less dependent on ad revenue as are most digital news outlets and so If you just look at the quantity of this short form, rapid digital news content compared to the long form investigations, which are the ones that ultimately make a really constructive policy difference. You know, there's just so much more. There's Mm. just, there is just so much of these digital articles that are coming out all the time and they are fear-mongering. They're sensationalist headlines. They they exaggerate the threat that the migrant poses or the criminal poses or the trans person poses and they don't actually... Uh, yeah, yeah, and they distort the conversation in our head. They but is this because a... we used to go and buy a newspaper? Children, when I was young, we used to go and buy a newspaper and we would pay for the news, literally, and they yeah. would sell ads in the news. But the main way that I think they made their money was we all paid for the paper. And now we don't pay for our papers. So now every article has got to also sell bikinis mm-hmm. or yeah, car wax yeah. or if, if you're not health paying, insurance or you're the product or <laughs> holiday insurance or whatever and so if you're not paying you're the product so that means because i i have um apple news on my phone mm-hmm. and so it offers me a bunch of different stories which i pay for apple news so it means that i don't have to pay for every paywall because they'll direct me to an article that might be in a publication i don't subscribe to mm-hmm. but about ukraine and mm-hmm. russia invading ukraine so i'll get that but i find it offers me a lot of stuff on the royal family and i'm like i don't click on stuff about the royal family why does it keep offering me this and i think it's cuz so many people do and i look at the royal family and like i think uh, someone said to me once the greatest human rights argument about abolishment of the royal family is for those in it yes. because their lives are being used absolutely to sell fast fashion and uh, car insurance as entertainment. And this is not the main reason to move into a place that is, I think, beyond the idea that one family is more special than other families. Mm. But that whole thing of Kate Middleton and Meghan Markle hating each other, oh, it's such, yeah. I, don't, I have no idea and it's oh. none of my business. Sister-in-laws get on or they don't. I don't know mm. if who yeah. of my friends gets on with their sister-in-law unless they tell me. It's none of my business whether they do or they don't. But what I do know, it's, it's a confected soap opera. Yeah to get clicks to sell shit. And every time we click on it, 
We yeah, make it worse. Know. We talked about this a lot in the fat phobia episode, that the very close economic relationship between the media and the diet and fitness industries and the yeah. fashion mm. industries and how that, that business model works. They are so intrinsically linked. It is it, when you really stop and think about it. So if there is an article about somebody's latest diet or somebody's latest mm. um weight loss or whatever it is and then there is a picture of them and then there is a link to the bikini that they are wearing in that picture and then if someone clicks on the link that outlet gets money yeah. and yeah. so it is in their interest to promote diets to promote thinness to promote clothes and and it, the, the it, line between digital the, news and e-commerce is is very thin well, what are we going to do now because we need you know yes there are guardian like models around the world. I think the Washington Post has got a similar model, maybe. I don't know. But what are we going to do if the news is now really just a billboard to sell shit and therefore they need to make the news as newsy as possible? And I'm really careful about what I click on now because if I click on something because I think I just have a look or I'm thinking I probably need to know, you know, as a feminist about what's happening with Prince Andrew. If I click yeah. on that, then I get 12 stories about Meghan Markle. Oh, and damn. I'm like, it's you so know, hard. so, so. <laughs> Can I ask you, what are you doing at Media Storm? And is anyone doing something similar? They must be. In podcasting, which is more or less a free, ungoverned space, are there any other ways to consume our news? Can you please tell us what do we do? Where is this new wave journalism direct us? Yeah, we need some ethical consumption of the news. Mm. Mm, well, the consumers do have power now because, as you're saying, if you're looking at your Apple News app, deciding which story to click on, you are giving information both to Apple and to the news outlets about how to rate their stories. So every single page, we can see how many people have clicked on it, how long people have lingered on it. So for the first time, or to an extent like never before, consumers are shaping the news. Journalists now are not telling people what we think they need to know. I mean, this is a generalization. We are telling people what we think they want to hear. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's the last days of Rome. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, here's 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 something that that maybe we could do to make it all a little bit better. Yes, please. What we're trying to do <laughs> is promote a greater sense of empathy in the yes. news. Yes. Yeah. And to really try and put yourself in the position of somebody who that story is about. And obviously, you know, one of the ways that that's going to happen is by having the lived experience voices speaking for themselves, is for having those people speak for themselves. But, you know, it can also come from the consumer. You can also pull that sense of empathy from within you and think about whether, you know, is this story, you know, developed for a culture war? Is this a real issue? Is this a real issue that matters to certain mm. minority mm. groups? Mm. Um, and also, listen. you know, diversify your newsrooms, for God's yeah. sake. But if listeners <laughs> are listening at home uh, who aren't running a newsroom... Yeah. There'll um, be a few. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> listen, up to 40% of our listeners don't run a newsroom. <laughs> Uh, and aren't related to Murdoch. So listen, uh, how do we... what do we do yeah. as customer pressure? Because if we are in Absolutely. fact customers of the news rather than receivers of truth, mm -hmm. um, if that was ever a thing, which it wasn't, because again, as you say, it was always the POV of the majority voice, the dominant group. But what can we do? Can we put pressure on our... Absolutely, yeah. People, journalists are not on the whole evil mastermind no, calculating how to preserve the power structure. Oh, I don't, think, like we will I don't blame listen. the journalists. Yeah, like no. if they if you're there and you're on a very now journalists are paid so little. If you're if you're sitting there on a very small salary and you're being told, get this story out, get this story out, get this story out, and you yeah. think, Oh, I would love to go out and talk to, you know, find I'm, and source fifteen people who blah 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 blah. But my I'm boss is shouting at me. about some mm. of the stuff that has my name on it from the past. Now the more we do media storm, I think, oh God, I did that, I did that. So First thing, if you read an article or you see a news story on the TV and it's about disability and there isn't a single voice of someone in there who has ever actually lived with a disability, then contact the news outlet and mm -hmm. say, hey, I think that might be bad journalism. You know, if you're a young reporter or journalist, don't be afraid to raise it with your editors. So it doesn't matter how junior you are um, or how isolated a consumer of the news you are send that message in because someone will see it and that's how these things change <laughs> I mean I genuinely 
have been blown away by Media Storm and, and beyond really, I don't, I'm I, apart from the you know first episode, I haven't had any editorial say or anything like that. But I continually get blown away by the things you're saying and the people you're meeting. Can I ask you what other outlets or podcasts or you know even Twitter feeds or whatever, or is there anything else we should be reading, following, looking at? Do what? Who yeah. do you rate? Yeah, who who do you the journalist listen the, <laughs> how, how do you who do you consume news wise? I read. This is every like news outlet. <laughs> I read everything, yeah. left to right. We and try, try and read to piece, everything. Piece together the picture. And from do you that. have any other recommendations of people who are doing something similar to you? Mm. So firstly, for every episode, we are releasing resource lists oh, on good. our social media. Yeah. Each resource list that we release has recommendations of things to watch, to read, to do, people to follow, and advice for how to report on that topic if you are a journalist. Great. So for example, we did an episode on survivors of sexual assault. And in that episode, we spoke to some really amazing people and they then have their own you know, either podcasts or news outlets or campaigns or things mm. that they're doing. And so we give, you know, advice for people to see who they can follow and how they can support. Like Leila Hussein, who was on our episode, has a fundraising page for Safe Spaces for Black Women. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is really important mm. because, you know, people experience sexual assault in different ways. So your podcast signposts uh, to other places that you rate... Can we hear your trailer? Drug like body shame. Criminals. Refugees. That. Crazy. Rape survivors. Vagrant. The homeless. Have you ever noticed that certain groups are spoken about in the media all the time, but never spoken to? Or maybe you haven't, because it's so damn normal. Media Storm is an investigative podcast from The Guilty Feminist that starts with the people who are normally asked last. We've already heard revelations from refugees, Asian minorities, sexual violence survivors and transgender people. Our next guests take us into their worlds of prisons, sex work, drugs and homelessness and onto the front lines fighting fat phobia and ableism. I'm Helena Wadia. And I'm Matilda Mallinson. And next on Media Storm. If you tell somebody their whole life that you're no good, what happens is they believe it. It is disgusting the way they treat people. He said, and I quote, I was fat. All they tell me is what's wrong with me. I don't know any different. So they wheeled me out in my wheelchair. I was just left there to die. You become abusive yourself. Needles were being pushed in, like, more roughly. I was being handled more roughly. He said that I got myself into this because I opened my legs. <laughs> I kicked off like a wild animal because they put me in the shower, six of them, cold shower, washing me, scrubbing me because I was dirty. The MRI scanners aren't big enough for overweight people. I've struggled to get officers to speak on the record about what goes on in prison. We're literally not allowed to. Advocates do not need to be a voice for the voiceless. We are empowered. We are Stop magic. Stop gatekeeping. Stop censoring people. I would love to know why the media asks the CEOs of a homeless charity anything about homelessness. I feel really um, invisible. Is the media reporting on or creating the crisis? Plot twist. <laughs> <laughs> this is not, I don't wait for the mainstream media to do anything. Drug like criminals. That crazy. The homeless. Hear our stories. We are the ones who have lived this. Our lived experience is leadership. We are the experts. It's really simple. Just just present both sides of the story. Follow Media Storm wherever you get your podcasts so that you can get access to new episodes as soon as they drop. If you like what you hear, share this episode with someone and leave us a five-star rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps more people discover the podcast and our aim is to have as many people as possible hear these voices. You can also follow us on social media at Matilda Mal, at Helena Wadia and follow the show via at Media Storm Pod. Also get in touch and let us know what you'd like us to cover or who you'd like us to speak speak to. Media Storm, a new podcast from the House of the Guilty Feminist, is part of the ACOS Creator Network. Have you got anything to plug other than please listen to Media Storm and rate, review and subscribe, give it five stars. Uh, and the more people who subscribe, 
um, the longer we can keep it on the air. And I think you'll agree it is a worthwhile show to have on the air. And it's from the House of the Guilty Feminists. So all you need to do is subscribe to it and uh, recommend that your friends subscribe to it and ideally rate it. And it really is worth five stars. And I say that genuinely hand on heart. It's easier to say it was someone else's podcast. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's yeah. arrogant. Yeah. It's worth five stars as well. <laughs> it's arrogant to say it about yeah. your own. But I think the guilty feminist is worth five Bless stars. Bless you. Bless you. Um, <laughs> and send us any ideas that you want us to cover, people Ooh. you want us to speak to. I yeah. already have so many that I'll talk <laughs> after. Like, definitely. Yeah, absolutely. So is there anything else you'd like to plug other than Media Storm Podcast? Yes. Yeah, so please follow our us on all social media at Media Storm Pod. The other thing I'd like to plug is that I have joined forces with the charities Level Up and Ava to go into newsrooms and to talk to journalists and editors about how to responsibly report on domestic violence. So if you are listening and you are a journalist and you think, hey, that'll be good for my newsroom, please get in touch. And uh, after I imploded at my former employer, I set up an organization called Refugee Media Center. Sorry, this won't affect everybody, so I'll be quick. But firstly, if you're someone who has been displaced and you'd be interested in having a platform in the news, then just search refugeemediacenter.org and you can join our network. And if you're a journalist looking to speak to people with lived experience, we will help connect you to them. Ah. Thank you very much. Both of those things sound really magnificent. Yeah. And I'm really proud and, and thrilled at the work you're doing. And, and honestly... I'm admiring of it. Stop. Yeah, it's been Stop an amazing. It. <laughs> it's been an amazing session. I like, genuinely I feel I've, I've learned so much. I'm gonna feel weird plugging my stuff now. Well, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Have you got yes. anything world changing to plug? Well, uh, yeah, I got uh, Instagram at Alison Spittle and uh, uh, Twitter. Also, I'm going to be in Edinburgh this year in the Pleasance, and it'll hopefully uh, be on sale by the time this podcast is out. I'm calling it Wet Deborah. Wet, Ooh. yeah, wet Debra. Wet Debra. <laughs> yes. I would go see that. You, look, wet Debra. I am going. This friendship is on very shaky ground. Kim Kardashian. I mean, Kim why don't you call it Wet Kim Kardashian? I like, should. Kim Kardashian. I should. Well, I was gonna. You know, I was. I was two choices of what I was gonna call the show, and I think I've settled on it. The first one was gonna be Wet, right? Because it's about aqua aerobics oh. and and other stuff. I'm so excited. And uh, the other one was. I thought of calling it silent wetness because it was about seeing a fight at, uh, at aqua aerobics <laughs> but you know you get it silent Some wetness, wetness. Oh, <laughs> I suppose to silent witness one of yeah. the names one yeah. of the names yeah. when we were brainstorming name for media storm please tell like, me it was silent wetness said to Helena wait Silent Witness, that's got a really good <laughs> ring to it. And I went, yeah, babe, I think we've heard that before. <laughs> Very famous television show. I think they're going to so sue. annoyed. I think they're going to sue if uh, if you if you use that. Because everyone's, but also everyone's going to think it's a uh, it's it's a companion piece to the television show. Yeah, <laughs> they'll be like listening for that podcast and be like, oh, well, this is quite interesting yeah. actually. You know. So your um, show's going to be on sale very soon. And it is. You, and it your is. podcast is still going of course yeah a wheel of misfortune with mm. loads of other people Fern is gone for the podcast but still in my heart oh. and uh, it was made such a nice time we went to Northern Ireland about a week ago and it was good crack and uh, we've we've different guest co-hosts uh, coming in also my old podcast Alison Spittle Show is coming back and uh, with me and you are going to be in Vicar Street in Dublin. I'm very, very excited about I that. I mean, you know Vicar Street's my favourite venue in the world. I know. Are we, are we trying to get it? I've said it before and I'll say it again. Mm. The Vicar Street audience know how to bring a rock concert to a podcast recording. They really do. <laughs> and it's on the 14th of March and you all should come. It'll be like a wonderful reunion after the pandemic. We've got some fabulous surprise guests. We will announce them soon, but yes. uh, you're going to be blown away. You have been listening to The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis White, guest co-host Alison Spittle and our very special guests Matilda Mallinson and Helena Wadia. Music was by Mark Hodge. The producer for The Spontaneity Shop was Tom Salinsky. Thanks to Rachel Croft and Gina DCO and everyone who made this episode happen as well as all of you for listening. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfeminist.com. <laughs> Yeah, I just need to get over the momentary imposter syndrome of being 
connected to new wave journalism. Um, <laughs> I, f- I feel if I had two men on here who had <laughs> this new cutting edge podcast and said, tell us about new wave journalism, they'd be like, oh yeah, it's actually a term that we <laughs> yes. coined. Yes. It's yes. really <laughs> about the movement we've started. We're at the heart of the new wave journalism. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we've been described uh, very much as, uh, as 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 the Watergate breakers of our <laughs> of our generation. The wave is crashing in a Watergate. Yeah. Oh yeah, like... absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And whereas what you're saying is, oh, uh, we are not sure it's us. It is you guys. So <laughs> it is it is you two. Well, Tell us new wave journalism. Tell us what is what do you think is new wave journalism and why? The guilty feminist is provided exclusively from Acast. Find it wherever you get your podcasts.